Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth episode of Cloud Chases. My name is Christian, and I'm joined by... Hello. Uh, today, we have a lot of topics to cover. We'll be talking about the new Ultimate deck, um, Three Brothers. We'll be answering some questions, and of course, a segment we actually forgot uh, last week, uh, Adam in the Rough, which yeah, is uh, slowly becoming uh, a favorite uh, from our uh, audience, at least uh, from the feedback we're getting. So we're happy you're enjoying it. Uh, but before that, uh, a little bit about uh, what's happening in your uh, TCG player life, uh, Uh Yeah, so the biggest thing that's probably going to be relevant for this week is uh, around the same time that this podcast gets uploaded, uh, both my OPO6 Sakazuki guide and Christian's OPO6 Gecko Moria guide will be out and available on our Patreon. Uh, there, they will both be very detailed and uh, in depth. And I think if you are not already a patron, you might want to check those out. And uh, yeah, just uh, I think they'll be worth it if, if you're going for good results in tournaments. And something oh. a bit less important on my side, I haven't been defeated at locals for a while now, so feels good. Usually, um, I just do terribly at locals. Uh, I'm gonna I'm not gonna discuss uh, our game then. Um, what I will say also that, uh, yeah, we put a lot of effort into these um, guides and I hope we uh, provide enough value that you can uh, support us also. Uh, other than that, uh, it's been a relatively quiet week, no big tournaments for a while now. Uh, there are some online tournaments happening relatively soon. Uh, we got into some, <laughs> we didn't get into quite a few others. Uh, the entry uh, process for the tournaments is as hectic as has always been. Uh, and I don't think there's any particular thing to mention. Uh, it's just, yeah, uh, a week of locals, um, testing, a lot of testing, especially now with the new uh, Three Brothers deck, which even though everybody is super hyped on uh, Monkey D. Luffy, uh, spoiler, I think all three can be can house a very playable deck. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not going to spoil my opinions, but in a way I already spoiled them. Anyways, uh, let us start with uh, questions from the audience. And uh, gone are the days where we were <laughs> missing the questions, and uh, welcome the days where uh, we have a huge backlog of questions, and we cannot spend uh, the whole episode just uh, on the questions, even though... There might be an episode of the pod which we'll just dedicate to the questions. Probably next week, honestly. Yeah, there's not uh, much content to fill it out. Yeah, yeah, and the quality of the questions is like the questions we actually want to answer. And uh, uh, with that, Hrvoe, uh, start us with the first one. Yeah, okay, so the first question is from Benson, uh, our actually uh, longtime friend from Flesh and Blood. Uh, he asked a very, I think, good question that people maybe don't think about is how do we choose decks? For major events. Um, so Christian, would you like to... I think your process is more interesting because usually you're the one who lands on not standard best deck as I usually do, so I think your thought process is perhaps more uh, enlightening to people. Uh, sure. Um, what First thing I will say that is something I learned the hard way back in my Flesh and Blood days, and that is no matter what happens, never change a deck one maybe even two days before the big event. Usually, most card games, even though you may think you are the greatest player ever, you really need time to get familiar with the deck, with the play patterns, because, trust me, you, you cannot just pick up a deck uh, a few days before uh, such a big event, where you need to know the matchups, uh, you need to know how to play in very different... Um, situations and so forth so yeah w whenever i pull the plug and be like okay i learned something very very interesting and i think i need to switch a deck it never worked out so tr make it a priority that you lock in a deck at least like three days in advance and stick to it whatever happens aside from that the process is a multi-layered one. One of the main things I want from my deck is ideally to not have a losable 
a, a completely unwinnable matchup. Even though in the end I played Pulfin, which had real trouble versus Zora, but I felt like the Zora was not going to be as represented, and um, that uh, it's not as horrible. It ended up being quite horrible, and it was a relatively represented deck, but I still think that the process was decent, because at the end of the day we are guessing, like, with the meta predictions and choosing what to play, when you're optimizing a deck you can often make correct decisions, but when you are trying to predict uh, the meta, especially when there's some weird element, um, for example, uh, people were really hot on Zoro, at least in the European uh, nationals. European nationals. Uh, you, you know what I mean. The European championship finals. Uh, that basically Zoro has a very good matchup into Sakazuki and they were really uh, like honing in on that. Anyways, so first thing I want from my deck is I would not like an uh, unwinnable matchup. This is, for example, why I'm very, very skeptical about taking Reiju uh, in the next following tournaments. Because the moment someone flips Red Purple Law, sitting on the opposite seat of me, like, I, I, I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to feel like I... Th th there's a big copypasta, if you remember, from Flesh and Blood days of uh, people taking... Uh, Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it ends with something like, and now your girlfriend is. I lost not, my job, my wife left me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, because. And now you're questioning why did you take uh, a yeah, but, tournament? But, but the, the most important part of that copy pasta, and the one that really rings true when you don't do well at an event and you're not happy with the deck choice, it's like, because you feel it, it's like, and now I have to wait six hours for my friends to finish the tournament so we can drive back home. And that yeah. really is true. <laughs> when, when you don't do well in a tournament and you're just sitting there waiting, like, it is the worst feeling. Like One Piece somewhat alleviates that because if, if, if you can still, if you're X2, you can still like try to fight for top 64 and get a good prize. But if you're X3, that feeling like already sinks in. It doesn't feel good. Anyways, so uh, ideally no unwinnable matchups. Then I'm actually slightly more valuing stability while you're valuing uh, raw power far more than me. Uh, that's why I ended up going with Gekumoria for Krefeld, What you ended up going with Sakazuki. Because I feel like with 5 life, I mean, th that's like the main difference between Gekumoria and Sakazuki. A, a lot of their uh, core mechanics are, are different. Their power turns are almost similar. I mean, stage build makes it a bit different. Uh, enables Gekumoria to actually have a very wide uh, removal range. And in Gekko, it's usually a more uh, proactive uh, Gekumoria. Anyways, uh, the fact that you have 5 life makes it far more resilient to Yamato, Sacking, to any other aggro deck, uh, Reiju even. Um, even though that Sakazuki can bottom deck, having that more life means that you can usually survive one more turn uh, after a judge turn. So I, I think this scaffold is an excellent showcase of differences uh, between uh, my preference and yours. And, um, and it is a preference. Like uh, Stability is oftentimes coupled with a slightly uh, weaker power level. And uh, yeah, that, 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 that is about it. Um, of course, you test a lot, you have to see that you basically have a lot of good matchups that you are, you have to be very uh, strong into the most um, represented deck. In, uh, in this case, it was probably Sakazuki. And I had a very, very decent uh, win rate in our personal testing. And in the end, I, yeah, sure, the only Sakazuki I lost to was in the finals, but I did beat uh, 
four or five Sakazukis on my way to the finals. So I I, I definitely, even in hindsight, uh, agree with my deck choice. Uh, what would you add to that whole? Um, I mean, I, I have quite a few things to add because, as you said, we have like different preferences in approaching tournaments. Uh, obviously, it's all rooted in testing. At some point, when the new product releases, we sit down, we test a lot, and then we like come to conclusions on what deck is the deck to beat, like what, what is going to have the best representation and still be strong. Because if a deck is highly represented but not strong, for example, Uta, because she's cheap at some point, there was a lot of Utas at like at least locals, maybe even like the first few regional treasure cups. He's not strong. You're not really gonna take that deck into like major consideration. Uh, and yeah, then the rest of it is just based on preference and lessons I've learned just uh, playing this game, playing other games over time. So a few lessons I learned playing uh, One Piece, especially in the early days when I wasn't as uh, invested and as prepared for the events I went to. Uh, the Milheim Regional in April or May last year in Germany. It was the first No Heroes Regional. Uh, if you remember, it's the one that was won by Smoker and Opio 2 by Justin Tillman and Kaido got second. And everybody was like, well, what's happening in Europe? Uh, for that tournament, I was debating between playing Whitebeard uh, and Red, uh, Red Green Law. Uh, and I felt proficient at both decks. Uh, but the main difference between Whitebeard and Red, Red Green Law is that Red Green Law, first of all, had a way... Uh, if you opened worse in Mirror, you had like way less chance of to, to come back because it was like a Vista, Robin, all the stuff to clear your board. Like comeback mechanisms were awful. And generally the deck wasn't as reliable as one would like. And I went with Red Ring Law. I, I felt like it was a bit of an ego thing as well. I felt like it, it, it's supposed to be the most skillful Killful. deck of mm -hmm. the meta. I was like, yeah, I'm, I, I want to prove I'm good. And then it didn't work out. I went 4-4. I lost, I think, two Mirrors because I lost Dyro. My opponent had like Nami, Vista, Bonnie, Find Law, and I, I was just breaking. It, it, it just didn't feel good, and I also lost, I think, a Kingdom that just had the perfect curve to rest and rest my board, start my resources. And then for the side event, on that same day, I, I went with Whitebeard, because I had a bit of a peculiar build of Strawbeard. Like, Moby Dick was legal, but I always played Strawbeard. And even in testing against Moby Dick builds, it felt like very 50-50 as a matchup. I tested a lot against Christian, who got uh, top 8 and 2 lose in that same format with... Uh, with the Moby Dick Whitebeard. Uh, anyways, deck was very strong. I ran an unusual card in Curly da Dadan. And then my deck was also very consistent. And I think I got second that side event. I had a very unfortunate loss where I misplayed. It, w it is what it is. And then for the next Treasure Cup, the only one, I got, I think, ninth place, which was just tiebreakers uh, screwing me out of the serial. And the lesson from that event was like, yeah, I, I need to play a consistent deck. It's a long tournament. My deck needs to be able to perform every single round. And that's already something I learned in, like, in Flesh and Blood, I just didn't apply it to One Piece. Because in Flesh and Blood, I did play aggressive decks, like, if you've played it, you, you know, like, Chain 5, Prison, whatever. Uh, but I just kind of forgot that lesson, coming into One Piece. And then, in a later tournament, um, in OPO 2, Treasure Cup Barcelona, where Christian got second with uh, Zoro, I played the, pretty much the same build of Whitebeard, but I had an awful start. I lost first two rounds to just deck not giving me the right cards. And Whitebeard, like, you, you still need to have some agency in early game to not completely fall behind. And I just opened nothing to play on board. And once I finally top-decked, like, uh, Vanilla, it got immediately outed by first Zoro, jet pistoling it, and then uh, Smoker, just uh, Sakazuki, six cost, killing it. And there I realized, like, the deck needs to be consistent, but it also needs to be stable. And Christian's performance convinced me that Zoro is probably the way to go. And in OPO3, I picked up Zoro, and that went fantastic for me. Uh, because it was a consistent deck, very strong, but it also had the stability. If you had a weak early game, you could still come back because you, you're you're five life, you're not bleeding life like Whitebeard every turn. And those two principles are pretty much the two things I stuck to since then in One Piece. Uh, and I would say my perception of what the best deck is always aligned with those principles, and I would always choose what I thought was the best deck at the time. So obviously when Sakazuki came out, in style it resembled... Uh, Wipe your Pirate Zoro, very much, I think, because the Fire Fist plays are kind of... Like, that, that type of removal is something Sakazuki does way more efficiently, but, you know, it's also something that, that Zoro of OPO3 had, and the good defense with Marco's Radicals, comparable to Rebecca's Borsellinos. Um, so, yeah, I will always try to go for a proactive deck that uh, that will still have some way of playing defensive, I guess. Uh, I, I prefer to play aggressive 
Like even the decks which are not traditionally played very aggressively, I will play aggressive. Uh, just because that, that's how I'm used to winning. Uh, and I think but I also piece... think that One Piece is an inherently very aggressive game. As in, yeah. I there were some control decks sprinkled out uh, across the meta, but I think that the game by its design is very rewarding if you are... As in, the game is rewarding you for playing aggressive. And sure... And they're not even giving us the, the strong tools to actually play a super defensive build. Aside from Aitko's Kid, which is basically OP1, um, Law can also go like super defensively with a lot of blockers. But if you think about it, it's all cards from at back at, <coughs> at the beginning, right? And uh, ever since then, we rarely get... I mean, I'm lying, actually. Uh, Queen was also... Um, yeah, and I mean, Tenko's the Flamingo is also inherently a very defensive card. Um, agreed, agreed. They, 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 put, they put something out here and there. But the end of, at the end of the day, I always feel like the aggressive options are usually stronger. And uh, even more consistent. Like, uh, a lot of control options revolve around high-cost units. 8-cost kid, 10-cost Dofi. And... Um, you really don't like your control deck to be as like pigeonholed into into a few cards. Anyways. Yeah. And and the way those control decks are probably going to evolve is something I personally don't like seeing and it's just yellow being able to heal up again and again and again. It's yeah. something that uh, I think becomes very annoying with NL in OPO seven once he gets once he gets the secret rare ace. And possibly even just adds seven cost moms for the fun of it and then has like sixteen healers in the deck, potentially. Uh, but yeah, the nature of control decks in One Piece, if you want to starve your opponent out of resources, you're not attacking their life, but then you need stuff that makes up that advantage, that's going to be high-cost units. And usually those are either not reliably searchable, either they can break your hand just by not having counters and uh, and not working when you intend them to. Like the, o the only real control deck that was good for a while was Rebecca and Obio 4. Uh, to return a bit to the deck choice question, uh, what Christian said at the start, I think, and what I think is his most painful lesson is do not switch your deck. Like, I, I'm repeating it because it's so important. If you know how to play a certain deck and you're prepared for it, like, for a while uh, going into a tournament, just stick to it. Do not make a last-minute switch to something else unless you're already very competent at something else. But if you, even if you do, like, even if you're competent at the other deck, do it, like, three or four days before the tournament and not on the night of the tournament. Uh, because I remember in our preparation for Euros... I was gathering, like, I was forcing everybody in our group to like, gather in voice chat every week just so we could discuss what deck choice we were going with, are we locked in? And there were some people who, who did lock in their choices, or so they said, but then the next week they would change their mind and try to play something else and uh, kept flip-flopping -flop, flip between one or two options, and those people do not perform well. Whereas those who just locked in early, generally, like, you have a deck, you learn, everything the deck needs to do in the meta. You, you can prepare for slight alterations or deck decks that come up. And you're generally just going to do better in a tournament because you have a deeper pool of knowledge uh, of situations that you can like respond to and just play better. Uh, and yeah, I think that's... And uh, before we end uh, this question and move on to the next, I'd like to share uh, a little bit of Cloud Chaser's lore with you. And that is uh, another copy pasta that... Um, was birthed from uh, Hrvoje's um, horrible run with uh, uh, Trafalgar Law. Uh, and it goes, uh, real friends don't let their friends play Law. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot that. But yeah, it um, might change with Red Purple Law, we'll see. Because I, I am planning to play that in OPS 7. Um, anyways, let's move to the other question. Yeah. Uh, question number two is from uh, Ivan Kvaric, who is a Croatian, but he doesn't live anywhere near Croatia. I think he's in Asia. Um, his question is, what are our thoughts on high-level tournaments being held online? And then he has his opinion, which I will not quote because it's rather negative. Uh, but yeah, we've both played quite a few online tournaments, and I guess we can just summarize our experiences. Oh, you can start if you want, Christian. Sure, uh, because I will echo uh, Ivan's statement. Uh, Feelings, sentiments, whatever. I genuinely, truly dislike online tournaments. If we had a client 
where you would play and which would enforce the rules, I would be perfectly fine with it. The webcam gameplay is just a horrible experience for me. I have to play the game. I also have to be super, super careful that my opponent is not cheating. And that is ju ju just a bad experience for for playing, but because I, I'm so focused on the game, the game is hard, and if I, instead of looking at my cards, I have to look at my screen to pay attention if my opponent is picking up cards from different compartments uh, around his house, uh, that is not how I want to play my game. On top of that, the delays are horribly long. Um, the rounds start at very erratic times, so you basically are glued to your PC most of the time. Like, you can not really get up, um, eat some lunch or something. You are basically, from the morning, as is a, a big Treasure Cup tournament, right? You, you're, you're there for the day, but it's, for some reason, so much more exhausting for me. Maybe because of the... Because of that fact that you are constantly having to police your opponent. And that, I, I don't know, uh, the, the, the feeling is just not there. I mean, e even from the beginning, where we have to roll, and I'm like, do I trust your dice? Uh, how should we roll? Shall we do high roll? Shall we do low roll? And if I ask you to do a low roll, and then they start, no, 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 let's do high roll, I'm like, Hmm. You're making it even more suspicious if I suggest a low roll and you're like, no, 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 no. Let, I'm surprised do you don't force the odds even stuff because oh, that, dude, that sounds I, like something I, I'm you would. Constantly trying to explain to people why odd even is the superior way of um, making the the random um, seating of who goes first, right? But uh, I, I'm just giving up to that with that because, like. Uh, I don't want to teach math to, to to everybody. Anyways. Uh, oh, okay. So, all in all, personally, if there were no online tournaments, I would be super happy. Sure, your EV is definitely better, because basically your EV for the tournament is like plus 300 euros, because you're not spending money to uh, travel or for the accommodation. But on the other hand, even though I'm getting kind of tired with traveling. Uh, as we always say, being around friends. Uh, and also, tr traveling is also inherently kind of cool. You you basically... It's far easier, at least for me, to, to get into the competitive mindset when we get somewhere else, and it's a tournament, and it's happening. It's... I don't know. That definitely feels different than just playing out of your room. So... Sure, better EV, but the experience is so much worse for me that I would be more than happy if it goes away. Mm, okay, so I sent Christian first for a reason, because I wanted to end this question on a positive note. Uh, I am quite a big fan of online tournaments, even though I usually perform worse in onlines than in offlines. Uh, I think that the biggest selling point of online tournaments is their accessibility. So if you live in a remote, relatively remote region or just cannot afford to travel much in general, it does more good for community than bad. And in general, I think the population of card game players, at least in One Piece and Flesh and Blood, because for Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic maybe it's different, uh, the percentage of population who would cheat and you know just stoop so low to to maybe perform in a car game is rather low. So maybe I'm too trusting of people, but it's not something I highly concern myself with. Uh, what I will say though, is I am very strict about some things on playing online, like some tricks that you, you can know about keeping your opponent honest. I, I will share them just because why not? Uh, first, the obvious thing is you want your you want to record your um, your matches. So if you're, if you're playing like on a toaster and you cannot run OBS, then a very solid solution is to like literally just point your phone at the screen, like mount it somewhere, point it, have it record. Like that's better than nothing, and you will have uh, like actual proof in case disputes come up. Uh, that said, I haven't had a single uh, like cheating dispute since I started playing in online tournaments. 
The closest I had was like an opponent who tried to activate a Perospero trigger after he already added the card to his life, or added the card from his hand to his life, and he then tried to use it, and I was like, nah, you cannot do that. Um, but the other things that you can do is, first of all, your opponents, and something you should avoid doing yourself is never take your hand out of frame. That's an instant judge call. Like, I, I don't care if you're honest or not. Like, this policy specifically says you are not supposed to do it because there are possibilities of cheating. So just be very strict with that. Do not let people take their hands uh, out of the frame. Like, you have to be a bit of a... I don't want to say rude. Like, you just have to be, like, firm and uh, not compromise on stuff that could lose you the game because it's cheating. Uh, then also, this isn't something people immediately pay attention to, so I'll, I'll specifically mention it. Uh, sleeve color should never be the same as the flame at color. If your opponent has those, like, the cards that are sleeved and face down might not be un might not be like good, very well visible, which is important if you need to know how much life they have. You don't want to make like those stupid mistakes. Also, their shirt color, especially if it's like a dark dark shirt, if they have black shirt and black sleeves, for me that's an instant like please like change your shirt. I might just call a judge because I, I don't think it, it, it makes it possible to hide cards like uh, in your lap or something, bring them up. Like, I, I don't want to deal with it. You, it's very simple. You're at home, you can change your shirt uh, very simply. Did uh, you really ask someone to change his shirt in a long time? Well, no, I haven't run into someone, no, not in, in, in One Piece. I did in Yu-Gi-Oh! But, which is also why I kind of like, I'm used to online tournaments, I guess, back when COVID was around. Uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! was the only uh, card game running uh, any sort of organized play because they used Remodo. Like, we just played over webcam. And that started very early on in COVID. So I just got used to playing, but I also got used to like watching out for cheaters and how to how to potentially spot issues. So yeah, a lot of those, that stuff is ingrained into me. Oh yeah, another thing is when your opponent shuffles and presents the deck for cut, I, I, I don't recommend ever doing the regular like half cut. Like I, I do something, I try to do something unexpected, contrived, like do three piles, put the middle one right, and then all of that on the on the left, and then nine cards from bottom to top. Like, not from top to bottom, but from bottom to top. And then, if they're trying to pull funny stuff, and I always change it around. Like, you, you just take any measure you can, and yeah, it's a bit of extra pain uh, in doing all that, but when you think about it, the environment is very relaxing. You're at the comfort, of, like, in the comfort of your home. Between every round, you can grab a snack, grab a drink. Uh, you can even go for a shower or a short walk if your game ended fast. Like, to me, those are all positive attributes just because it makes for a more relaxing tournament setting, whereas you might be stressed from traveling. Like, a lot of things can go wrong in an offline tournament. Like, the weekend from hell in Wolverhampton is, like, the shining example of just being too stressed to function as well as you would like. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm generally a supporter of online tournaments. I do think uh, the incentives for potential cheaters in One Piece are rather high, but I also think the general player population of One Piece is much more honest and nice than, than other card game populations, so I'm not too concerned about it, but I will take uh, you know, proper measures to make sure I don't get cheated. And one thing I always say about cheating is, it's been a while now, uh, the game is almost a year and a half old, and we slowly are getting to know each other, we are slowly becoming like a, a big community, and trust us, uh, Risking getting your name muddied uh, as being a cheater is such a horrible proposition for any player who's seriously considering being competitive at the game. It's simply being on good terms with your other players will give you so, so many benefits that, uh, at least for me, um, that's such a heavy incentive to, to never cheat. I mean, aside from the usual incentives to never cheat. Uh, just, just being a good, good human, imagine. Good human being, or, yeah, and uh, uh, integrity of the game and integrity of uh, competitiveness. Even aside from that, I I value like that every, every one of my opponent can know that he can trust me, he or she. Um, I personally value that uh, very highly. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I also think I, I agree with you that I, I would definitely not think that cheaters are very prevalent uh, in our community, but 
the online environment just makes it you also want to be sh like certain that your opponent is not cheating right as in sure i'm not expecting it but i also want to make sure especially if it's so easy to do as it is in online anyways oh yeah well i think we've said what we have to say we can move on to the main topic of today's podcast uh, which is the set review, or I guess deck review for uh, Star Deck 13, Three Brothers. But before we do, uh, also, uh, once again, reminder, please send us questions. We we definitely got more than plenty, but uh, always keep them coming. Uh, we like hearing A, what, what you would want from us, B, what you're interested in from us. Uh, so it, it's one of the best ways you can get, engage with us. Just ask us questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, as, as we said earlier in the episode, we might just do a full episode just answering questions and then doing... Uh, because when, when there's content drought, like, there's not much to talk about because there's few tournaments running. Like, you can just answer all the questions that you, that you ask. Uh, anyways, uh, do you have your card list page open, Christian? Oh, definitely I do. Uh, but, but before uh, we go into the, the uh -huh. cards themselves, I would definitely like to preface this that actually ultra decks are becoming my favorite product like a one piece product they are usually very good proposition for your value they design them in a way that they give you usually multiple playable decks it's a great entry point for new players like i'm even the first one the, the three captains i was very impressed and I think they upped the game uh, with this one, even from the collectability standpoint and from the playability standpoint. Uh, so, uh, like, I, I can already tell you I'm super hyped for this uh, starter. And whenever they uh, announce another Ultra Deck starter, I'm, I'm so ready. Yeah, it's definitely uh, the best starter deck lineup or, like, the best type of product they do. I guess it, it's also paid for by the price. It's like twice the MSRP of the usual starter decks. Uh, but yeah, the thing they did with like the extra pack that uh, you can get the higher rarity version of a card is very nice. Personally, I don't really like those cards. I've seen them IRL. They're not, they're not textured. That's basically it. I like my foils to be textured, and this, these aren't. They're just black and white with some splashes of color. But still a very good collector incentive. Uh, one thing that this deck is missing compared to SD10 is some reprints. Like, obviously, Nami and Razoro didn't really need reprints at that point in time, as both cards were falling out of favor in the meta. But just the leading principle behind doing a cool reprint with an alt art of a card that is desired, especially when it's like a favorite character, is I just think a good practice. Like, something they could have maybe done for this deck, just Maybe we include it as an extra card because it's not in yellow. It's like reprinted Opio 4 Sabo with a new art or something like that. Maybe one Sabo, one I don't know, starter deck, one Rush Luffy, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's any 5 cost aces before. There's the promo red one, I guess, but that, that doesn't. Point being, maybe they could have reprinted some yellow or other color card in here as well, just as a neat inclusion. But yeah, generally these decks are, are the best type of product. Especially for new players. Um, yeah, uh, and also I that is one of the things I actually very, very like about One Piece. And that is, I think that they struck a very fine line <laughs> between flesh and blood and magic. Magic has so much product that I think people get dizzy with amount of new content, new cards. They're constantly bombarded with new things to do, and I think all that they are getting fatigued. Flesh and Blood, on the other hand, has not a lot, not enough, I think, content. We get periods of three or four months where we're playing the same format, nothing is changing, there's nothing to look forward to, and it feels kind of stale. One Piece sprinkles these little starter decks uh, in between sets, and they always change just enough that the environment is interesting, changing, but not overwhelming. And I absolutely adore uh, 
adore this about One Piece. Yeah, I, I didn't think about that, but now that you mentioned it, I was like, it's really cool when in Yu-Gi-Oh, because F- Flesh and Blood doesn't do any new stuff in precons, but in Yu-Gi-Oh, it was really cool when like starter decks, starter deck strategies became meta, because then, first of all, they are very cheap and affordable, so a lot of people can get a meta deck and start like playing more competitively by just buying three starters in Yu-Gi-Oh and building a deck core off of it, like Salamangrate or Monarch, if you, if you played Yu-Gi-Oh, you probably remember those examples, they were everywhere when the starter deck was released. But for most releases, it was just like irrelevant, faded into obscurity within two days. So yeah, I think the fact that Bandai makes almost every starter deck product relevant to the meta is a really good sign. Like the 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 only one that you could maybe say were underwhelming were the Yamato and Black Luffy, but Black Luffy did have a good showing in OPO three here and there, and so did Yamato. So even those two, at least for the leaders, I wouldn't call them failures. Like. They had some... I mean, technically, the very first one, the the film Shanks, had some interesting cards, oh, yeah. but it was especially the leader was so underwhelming. Okay, at, at the time it was very much not interesting to play with, but later on, even those cards got their time in the mm-hmm. sunlight with the Definitely. film Doffy. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, shall we start with the individual cards? Yeah, finally, you can take it with the first leader, Sabo. Okay, uh, widely considered the weakest one. Uh, Sabo is a 4-life red-yellow leader with an ability of prerequisite one on activate once per turn. You may add one of your characters with cost 3 or more and 7k or more power to the top of your life cards face up and up to one of your characters gains plus 2k power until the start of your next turn. Okay, uh, the ability does not sound that exciting at first. But I actually tested quite a lot of Yamato. And putting your own characters into your life can present you with some very interesting tempo considerations where you can actually overextend yourself a bit and make yourself out of your out of reach for your opponent to kill by just putting something on, on top. And also, I think that Sabo will be best played in a similar fashion, where the thing you put on top is something which can usually uh, come back into play for free. <laughs> Basically being a uh, Land of Wano. Yeah. Hikinujo and uh, the other Land of Wano cards, right? Nekomamushi, probably. Uh, did did mm-hmm. you try Danger as well, or any of the other ones? Uh, I mean, uh, w- when I tested the full uh, Le- uh, Wano build, and we might do, do some gameplay with that, because I think it's actually quite funny deck. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I even played Danjiro. Anyways, um, and if you, if that's the effect, where you, you do quite a few things. First of all, you're saving that character. That character would be rested and can be easily attacked. But now if it's in your life and they attack into it and they trigger it, in a way you restand it, that character, right? You also got one life, so it's at least worth one card draw, as in your opponent attacks with with their leader, you would counter to be at the same situation, right? Uh, so it's at least worth a card, sometimes even more. And this effect of giving your one of your characters plus 2k is unassuming, but actually quite potent. If you have like a 5k uh, attacker, now he can immediately, or she, swing for 7 and be a complete menace. Like, uh, how do you remove 7k bodies? It's quite hard. On the other hand, usually they're relatively low-costed, so for Sakazuki, it's whatever. And I think that a lot of these cards from this set will be far stronger once Sakazuki rotates, because a lot of the things they do, I feel like doesn't play well naturally into Sakazuki. But once Akazuki is gone, and you can no longer <laughs> as easily bottom deck uh, Kikinuja, or, uh, I don't know, Arash Zora, who is now a 7k, right? Um, I think uh, they'll definitely pop up a little bit more. For now, Sabo, a very aggressive leader, I think, which basically rewards you for the aggressiveness by giving you a safety cushion, where you, A, make it harder for your opponent to hit into your stuff, and also makes it almost impossible for him to race you. 
because you're basically constantly uh, getting ahead by one life. Um, now, I said I think that's the strongest way to play him. The way they designed it here is, haha, you put the the big Saba Luffy or whatever to your life, then you can take out the small one and then do the whole shenanigan, right? And I don't think that is the strongest way to play Saba. Which basically is kind of weird that he's out of the three, he's the less he's the only one who is basically not as synergistic with the whole like growth of a little Saba becoming a big Saba, right? Uh, mechanic which is kind of central to this uh, starter. So yeah, uh, Sabo, I think, has a lot of potential. And most of the potential, as I said, comes from insane triggers uh, from the Lenovana cards. At least with the current card pool. All in all, ability, pretty strong, I would say. What's your opinion? Uh, so yeah, I'm, I also think that uh, he's aggressively geared. I think one angle that you didn't really mention, but uh, he is a revolutionary army leader, which kind of makes him, a, mm. I think by default, already better a better mm. Bello Betty, because unlike Bello Betty, he doesn't minus a card to give a buff to his whole board. And that's a, a very important thing about Bello Betty. She gives that buff to like three things, but you don't need a buff on three things. Usually you only have uh, one, maybe two revolutionary army characters that are like 7k power get an effect. Uh, Sabo will provide uh, one of those with the needed buff, and maybe you can attach one for the other. In any case, you can you can perform those actions more efficiently. Uh, Revolutionary Army package as a whole, at least the part with trigger effects where you still need to discard and your color, your leader needs to be dual color, is not as interesting. Uh, but he does provide that angle where you can include a good aggressive red engine because cards like Karas and stuff are quite amazing. Uh, and the main uh, obstacle we will still run into is, of course, as Christian said, Sakazuki is in the meta. And when you play a leader like this, you want some, at least one turn of building up a board and then, you know, starting to apply pressure and then keeping the wave of pressure going. But if your board just disappears while it's still active, that doesn't work. Uh, one thing you could, like, sort of do to alleviate that is you could play the Evolve uh, build, but as Christian said, like, Sabo doesn't really... Uh, like, the Sabo characters don't really matter. It's the Rush Luffy from STO one and uh, Rush Ace from this starter. That would be the main uh, benefactors of such a playstyle because they're five-cost Rush units uh, that you can put back into life and then bring them out again. So, like, if your Rush Ace lives, and decent odds he does, if he doesn't get removed with an effect, he's a 7k. He swings 7, uh, you put him back into life, buff something else, play out the small, Ace, swing again. Uh, now your leader is also 7, so your leader swings at least 8 because you have the don attached. It has like those very aggressive play patterns that can put a lot of pressure uh, after in the, after like the initial setup stages. Because once again, as I said, uh, these aggro decks, they, they like a turn of setup and then they, they can start popping off. Uh, if that's enabled, I, I can definitely see Sabo having some real aggressive promise. Uh, you heard from Christian, we will try to feature it in a gameplay video later on. Uh, because... These, like, funky, unexpected decks can definitely take people off definitely, guard. Definitely. Especially if you never played against it. For example, <laughs> once Saba starts dropping Kikinujas and you're like, okay, what's happening? You, you can get uh, quite run over, yeah. Yeah, because, like, the, the thing is, you give 2k to something that swings. And even if that's some 5k unit, now it's 7k until on, on the opponent's turn. So it's not like something they can easily remove with combat. If they go there trying to starve you instead of hitting your life... Because like you have Kikunoja in life, if they hit you, they just you're, you get your Kikunoja back. They cannot hit it because it's active, and if they hit your seven K character, you're having an easier time defending it. And red, and even yellow already have a ton of really good defensive resources, like mainly Radical Beam and Guard Point, which are Radical Beam is slightly anti synergistic with Sabo Leader effect, but uh, you get what I'm I mean. You to say still it. play it, like well, obviously. Radi <laughs> Radical Beam is just an insane card. Um, so yeah. Uh, a lot of cool things, and not only that, the the like the pop of potential is is like insane. Like, imagine this: you have nothing on your board, ten don, okay? Rush Luffy, boom, for seven phase, okay? 
or even whatever, six face. Don on the on the leader, six face, put Rush Luffy uh, on top of your life, little Luffy pops into the big Luffy, and you can go, uh, no, you can actually buff your leader, so it's eight face, and then two Don uh, remaining on, on the Luffy, eight face unblockable. Like, so you, out of not a thin air, you produced a 6k, an 8k, and an 8k swing with just two cards. Like, not a lot of decks can do that. Yeah, it's sort of a, I want to say, not more efficient Whitebeard because the Luffy is going to be 6k on board. But, yeah, I mean, aggressive potential is there. And the only problem is, as with most 4-life aggressive leaders, is can you keep uh, enough cards in your hand to actually, first yep. of all, not die, and second of all, to keep your board so that you, so that you can actually finish the opponent off. Because that's always the main obstacle, you run out of cards eventually, and then... Uh, a control deck just uh, ends you. And I think that he has the tools built in right there. The fact that you heal and you can also save your characters, exactly what you need, right? It's not exactly card draw, but in a way it's card draw. Okay, so Salvo. Uh, definitely gets a pass from us, I think. Yeah. Uh, like I think these leaders, all three, are very well designed, so... We'll, I'm sure we'll discuss discuss them even more in depth in the future. But uh, let's move on to the next one, uh, which is Blue Yellow Ace. So, uh, once again, 4-life leader. Uh, his effect is Dawn 2, attached, activate main. Uh, you'll get five, top 5 cards of your deck and add one character with exactly 5 costs to top of your life cards face up. And then end of turn you have to trash all of your uh, life cards which are face up. Um, so this leader... First of all, blue yellow. We can think of which which leaders had this uh, color combination in the past. It was Queen uh, from OPO four, uh, and it was a very control heavy leader type. So if you're thinking of doing some control like strategy where you put uh, something from top of your deck into life and then flip it face down to effectively gain one life, you're probably better off doing that with with blue yellow Queen. I think the real uh, promise of blue yellow Ace. Is also in a more aggressive manner. I could say I disagree. I already see him. No, no, no. Uh, I, I, oh. I definitely agree. I, I think that he's basically the most aggressive, maybe even out of all of, all of these, because essentially, in a way, the dream is to every turn get a big Sabo Luffy or Ace, right? Yeah. And that can be overwhelming. Anyways, yeah. Please continue. Yeah. So his ability is, in a sense, pure card advantage. You put one card from top of your. Uh, from top of your deck into your life, and then you're free to do something with that card. Now, ideally, that would be the the yellow Luffy, the yellow uh, Rush Ace. I believe we get the Blocker Ace in OPO 7, the blue one. And uh, then you get the leader buff. You're naturally swinging. You, you play the kid naturally, play out the, the thing from life, get the leader buff, swing 7 with leader, or 9 with leader, sorry, because you have the two don attached. Uh, you have the potentially rush ace to swing as well for seven. So you just started playing a lot of pressure. And then at any point, you also have the access to blue control tools. Uh, first of all, the card that should come to mind when you think uh, blue, especially in this format, is uh, pudding. If you're playing aggressively and forcing your opponent to take life, take, uh, like start amassing big hand, and all you're doing is throwing big, sw big swings at them, uh, the situation they could easily find themselves in is having eight or nine cards in hand and then you're just putting them, and you take four cards away from their hand, and your turn isn't really hurt by that, because once again, your base play can be very cheap. Attach two don't to leader, and then spend two don't to play a kid. So if you play pudding on eight, you still have the room to swing seven and nine again if you find ace on top of it. Obviously, blue as a color has a lot of uh, top deck manipulation tools, which are kind of redundant in a deck like this, just because Basically. leader is already going to look at uh, top five cards. But, you know, you, you can just guarantee stuff while having some defensive tools, which would usually be just cards that you counter with uh, in your hand. Uh, another thing you can do with face-up life cards is abuse them for effects like uh, Hiyori or uh, mm -hmm. Machino, whatever, Newgate. And also the upcoming Flump is probably going to be the most relevant one when she releases in uh, Memorial Collection. It simply provides a very simple way to generate card advantage 
which is something that the queen did not inherently have. So queen had to basically resort to going down to a very low hand size, and then every play mm -hmm. he made at that point, it had to be a high-value play because he had very little hand to work with. So he needed the Yamato, the Katakuri, the Mihawk, and then... And also made him life. very predictable. Yes. Like, the most predictable deck in the game. Okay, I will, I will not try to argue that point, uh, because it, we will probably just waste time on it, but yeah, I think Ace has a lot of aggressive potential, and the more support he gets, the more he's going to be relevant as a leader, because once again, getting a free life, like, th this is a free life, you're not tapping to them, they're attached to leader, you're gonna swing. So you're just effectively getting a free one life that you want to spend by the end of the turn. Like, you, you can even just flip it face down, like, there's cards that flip these face down, and you're just fine doing that as well. Uh, um, I think it, it, it bears to, like, explain some of the lines. Usually what I think is, you always have a package of four done, two on your leader, and then two to do something with that life. Uh, the high roll, of course, is if you hit the big Sabo, Ace, or uh, Luffy, then you're golden. Then you just play the little one, and you push. The problem currently with Ace is, you only have the 12 yellow big ones uh, that come in this set, right? And if you think about it, searching 5 cards for 12 cards, if you play all 4 of them, those are not the best odds of hitting. So, I think, at least in the beginning, Ace should be built with also some other 5 cost characters, yeah, Shirahoshi, just that you can put. Yeah. Shirahoshi, Satori uh, are the two that come to mind, yes. And if you have all of them, then it's 12 to hit really big, and 20 to hit anything, like to, to fill your life. If you hit anything and you're you're missing the, the combo, you still have Hiyori at least now to actually basically sure you spend a card but you can either put a trigger and basically you got one life which is a not bad deal for for a single card, right? Or uh, I think Viola is coming in In Maybe one, yeah. Yeah, which just uh, flips your um, life face down, and it's a it's a blocker. Walker, it's, it's a yeah. relevant card, right? So I think that Ace also looks <coughs> very reliant on going second, because the combo will always be some combination of four or more done, right? So I never like decks which are very very show uh, shoehorn in. I mean, I guess on 5 Dawn, you can also, uh, you have 1 Dawn for a searcher effect, uh, where you maybe hit a Luffy and you don't have Luffy, oh, you can still play a search effect to maybe get the little Luffy, so there's something there. But all in all, uh, if your, like, your low roll is your ability giving you a life, and your high roll is basically defending one or two opponent attacks, which is also card draw in a way, right? If if I'm 7k and I prevent two 5k swings, that's insane value. Man, whoever always tells me that I'm I'm using insane uh, way too liberally, but it it's something that cannot be understated. It, it, you're getting a lot. You For 4 Dawn, you're swinging 9. You prevent two, one or two swings, and you got you cheated the 5 cost into play. Yeah, okay. The the easiest comparison to make is with Gekko Moria. Your high roll is a way better resolution of Gekko Moria leader effect, because for 4 Dawn, you bring out a 5 cost, which is like 3, three Dawn to bring out a 4 cost in, uh, in Gekko Moria, but you also get the defensive resource. The down... I, the downside, because it's conditional like Gekko Moria, you need to have a specific card in hand or hope to see it on top of the deck uh, to make the high roll really work, but then when, when it works it's Gekko Moria with a way stronger defensive like side to it because your leader is now 7k and you also swung for a lot more damage and more aggressively at your opponent and Gekko Moria, as we know, is a really strong leader right now, so uh, So all I know, I I really like Ace as in not only that, I think he maybe has the highest potential uh, as we get as we get more five cost units. Because if you can yeah, do that, because uh, if if you can do that consistently, this will be a menace. So uh, 
very high remarks, at least for me. For he him. said that in a very podcast voice. This will be a menace. That's how I imagine podcasters usually talk. Like, yeah, well, we're getting better, man. Uh, every day, every day. Okay, uh, what's your take on uh, Luffy, who is considered probably the strongest out of the three? Oh uh, yeah, he's going to have an immediate impact on the meta. Like, be- oh yeah, let's just read it out first, of course. So, uh, black yellow for life. First of all, it has like a continuous effect, uh, permanent effect rather. Your your face up life cards are placed at the bottom of your deck instead of being added to your hand according to the rules. Uh, with two don attached, you can activate main once per turn. If you have zero life, you can trash one card from hand and add up to two characters with a cost of five from your hand or trash to top of your life cards face up. Uh, oh, I just remember something about Ace. Oh, we'll, we'll continue with the Luffy. Uh, this ability is obviously you want to hit zero life Ace up, and you want to really strongly rely on having your kids upgrade into into their teenage, I guess not not adult because they're still like kids, but in their into their teenage versions, buff the leader like massively, ideally to nine k, and start getting big swings in. So I already know a lot about how this deck plays because it it was very popular in Japan while I was there. We have seen a lot of gameplay videos of it by now, and people are already testing it in ranked sim because it is legal as of Sunday, as of I believe. Today, I Sun- think. Or or yesterday? No, yeah. S- yeah, yesterday. But we are. This is published on Wednesday, so sure, four yeah, days yeah. back when, when when people watch this. Um, so yeah, it's a leader that aims to. Like once again, it has an aggressive angle. You you're, you're you're just trying to kill the opponent and not die. That's what you can say the the gameplay boils down to. You play the Garp Searcher to search the uh, the missing pieces, and then the Garp Searcher is having Dawn attached and swinging because the more life you take early game, the easier your uh, finisher is in the late game with just the eleven k leader swing, seven k a swing. Even Sabos can swing if you don't need the blockers or if you have extra blockers. And yeah, the power is there. It's like combining currently the two strongest, two strongest colors in one piece, in black and yellow. Uh, we don't I think really it's really hard to, to about this. This uh, this proved that fact. I I agree. Like Gecko Moria, like for some reason they made it that this leader ability aligns perfectly with the Gecko Moria play. So you you get constant recursion of of kids bringing stuff out mm-hmm. of life, and since Black Sabo is a black card, and you can bring it out with small Sabo, it means you have unkillable board, you filter your hand for finding more and more pieces that you need, more Gecko Morias, more kids, more adults, or teens, whatever. Uh, and then your leader is still 9k, you're pressing very offensively, and you have this blocker. You have a 9k leader, one blocker, or potentially two blockers, and that's something that's very difficult to deal with, once again, like all the other leaders in, in this deck, it does uh, face a problem called Sakazuki, where if your stuff gets bottom decked and you're not playing with the resources that you must have to play, you're not going to have a fun time. But generally, all this deck is going to have quite the impact on the meta. If not immediately, then when, when Sakazuki is banned in OP07, uh, this dismantles Moria, because Sabo every turn and big leader, you know, black decks, other black decks cannot handle that. Uh, yeah, uh, Gecko Moria 8 cost is probably the strongest card in the game, and uh, in my guide, I, I probably. have a joke with you. <laughs> is, I, is there I, another I, contender? I basically, say, I basically say that we're definitely going to remember this format as Gecko Moria format, I think. The, the, the character, right? Even though I think also, of course, the, the leader is pretty strong. So, and I think Monkey D. Luffy is possibly the deck. Of course, Gecko Moria as a leader uh, has easiest access to uh, Etko's Gekko Moria because you can recur him and uh, in a way search for him, right? With the milling from the top and then uh, getting it with Hogback. Luffy, on the other hand, I think has the strongest combo. Like, two uh, on 10, right? Uh, two Dawn use the ability and then get a Borsalina and a small Sabo, get the big Sabo. You have two blockers. Your leader swings for 9k, is 7k uh, on opponent's turn. You have two blockers, which are unkillable, and you have one life. Like, dying from that position is a pipe's dream. If you can do that, again, my god. It's so much value on board, so much defensive, like, 
value. In a way, it almost reminds me of the worst parts of NL, where they just have strong bodies, and in a way, they're unkillable. But this feels even more oppressive in, in that manner, as in, it's even harder to push than NL, because NL is still, like, weak to uh, 5k spam swings and uh, slowly losing cards. Here, you don't have that issue. Be being a 7k leader is very, very hard. The, your only like lose condition is if your opponent has a ton of big bodies, but to get to that point, there has to be enough time. You're also relatively aggressive, you're swinging hard. So naturally, the deck is super strong. Uh, the problem is, it has a very strict condition to use the ability, and that is, you have to be at zero life. So your opponent needs to, needs to sometimes help you get there, and if they're smart, they're not going to help you. <laughs> or, if you take swings aggressively, let's say you take two swings aggressively. Well, that, that's the other option, yeah. Then suddenly they can be like, okay, I'm going to put you to zero on uh, like seven, eight dawn, where you will have a hard time really using your ability. And then uh, well, I'll just bleed you out of the cards, right? So uh, there is there's definitely going to be a learning curve playing against this deck and playing with this deck. Yeah. And I think it's also going to be one of the least like noob friendly, as in I think it can punish you heavily. It can also be quite anemic if you don't know how to play it. And also, I think it's far, far stronger uh, in a way uh, than Yamato, but if your opponent knows how to play versus this, I think they can abuse certain situations where they can put you in a difficult position, simply because you are kind of forced to play a certain way, right? Uh, so all in all, one of the strongest combos in the game. Works naturally with the strongest card in the game. Uh, it gets better support as <laughs> as new sets come out because EB1 and EB1 yep. has Fuante. Uh, OPO7 will have the, the Egghead Luffy, which is amazing in this deck because it gives you a, a way more reliable source of removal. Uh, I think there's something else, but I'm forgetting it. But yeah, already those two are quite big upgrades to what you have to run currently. Yeah, so definitely strong, definitely weird, as in, please, uh, if you're aiming for any tournaments relatively soon, uh, put a lot of time into this. Like, you really need to nail this deck, either playing it or playing against it, ideally both, whatever deck you choose. Because, like, the value you get out of learning this deck, I think, is overshadowed uh, but nothing in, in the game. Yeah, you, and of you... course... Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, no, no, please. Go on. No, uh, my mind is going to be like more meta-related, so... Mm -hmm. uh, because I really think that there's quite a lot of decisions where you can either punish them, leave them on, at one life, or if they take two or three 5k swings, suddenly you can really pressure them. And also, the deck is rel seems relatively card-hungry. Like, you need to discard a card to use the ability, right? You also probably have to play Moria or something, right? So, even in that best-case scenario, you're still losing two cards. Doesn't seem like a lot, but... If your hand size is, like, five, and now you lost th two cards, and your hand size is three... You can be... Uh, under a lot of pressure, even though you're a 7k leader. Especially if opponent has, I don't know, one Moria on the board, right? Yeah. So, a very interesting deck. Uh, one concept I also have to add is, of course, you can get starved, as in your opponent can just not attack into you. And I think that this deck will have to dedicate a lot of deck slots to <laughs> what we call self-awakening. Uh, I, I played uh, some... Dragon Ball, right? Dragon Ball, yeah. yeah. And in that game, you... It functions quite similarly to One Piece, but uh, you, in that game, you spend a lot of your deck slots uh, to cards which just uh, 
a tick life, uh, which is a concept we didn't. We, we always had it in One Piece. Uh, there's quite a few cards which do that, but none of them felt needed because none of the effects were as important. Uh, I have two examples of the top of my head that dominated the meta. Radical Beam, Marco. Just, <laughs> we definitely... Like, th you could not take... No, no, uh, those are the cards which benefit you from being low on life. But oh, you, mean you, you don't really have an example, I, at least I think. Uh, Whitebeard? Self-awakening cards. Cards which take life. You and could you run want... Squad and Whitebeard? Hmm? You could run Squad and Whitebeard? Oh, yeah, and, and, and we did uh, back when... Um, Whatchamacallit? Uh, back when Moby Dick was around, right? Because you, 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 it didn't matter and the effect was actually very strong. Uh, sure, but aside from that card, uh, which ended up not being as, as meta-relevant, maybe as, as it should have been, because uh, Moby Dick got banned quite uh, soon. Anyways, uh, I think Luffy will have to run at least, my guess is 10-ish. Ten, of those cards. Uh, examples being um, the 5 cost Luffy, uh, Sabo, 5 cost Sabo, which the, he plays naturally, right? But there's also one 2k, is that the Flam, Flam whatever? Uh, uh, Flam to from EVO, she's 1 cost. 1 cost, uh, oh, yeah, take she's life. Two, it's 2k counter, yeah. yeah. Uh, take life, draw a card. Take life, draw a card, yeah, yeah. Uh, which basically does nothing except, like, yeah, uh, r run you through your life, right? Uh, so, what I'm trying to say is there's also deck uh, construction uh, limits on the deck. Which, if you can get away with just running uh, Flam, whatever, whatever she's called, um, then you're fine. But if it ends up that you will be needing a little more help there. That might uh, pull the overall uh, power level of the deck uh, down. Uh, because you have to spend more uh, more parts of your deck to that concept and less on the payoff of uh, when you actually pop off, right? Yeah. Um, also, I, I think that there were points in the, in the game where uh, this leader might have been actually mid. For example, when uh, Whitebeard was all the rage, I think this leader doesn't play that well, because once Whitebeard starts spamming 9 costs, he will overwhelm you. Uh, even though you are 7 or 9k, right? But it kind of goes the other way around. He can also spam big swings into Whitebeard, so... It would be we can test that matchup in some uh, in some showcase of gameplay down the line. Maybe, maybe. Anyways, like, uh, I think everyone is aware that this leader is very strong. Uh, I, I think we got kind of sidelined with, with, with all the other uh, tangents and concepts. Uh, and I also definitely want to stress that the other two leaders are pretty strong as well. Uh, even though Monkey D. Luffy is proven to be strong, uh, don't discount the other two. But yes, uh, Monkey D. Luffy is unmistakably uh, a strong leader. Yeah, because and mm -hmm. in, at the end of the day, even like when you enter Wars of Attrition, if you have big bodies and your opponent doesn't, what you can do with this ability is just gain two life. It doesn't matter that those cards will go to the bottom. You're not two life. They need three swings to kill you. And if you have like two two Ks in hand, that's already a very very uh, difficult thing to execute if your leader is buffed. So. Yep. Like if you have the left or if they didn't take your last life and you you had the kid to upgrade it and then you put two life just to have life and you're seven k as a leader and have two two k's you're not dying you're in a very good position you like it this this is a very flexible leader it has a lot of uh, knowledge you'll need to both play it and play against it and the thing I want interrupted Christian earlier when I thought I wanted to say it but obviously we're going to be making a guide for this leader we haven't yet agreed on which one which one of us will be doing it. Uh, but you will be able to find a guide on our Patreon. Uh, and it actually month. might be the first guide that we do collaboratively, uh, because there's quite a few things to explore, at least initially. Uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, let's move on to before uh, we put our players, uh, listeners to sleep. Uh, Edward Newgate uh, comes back, 
And here's a yellow card, uh, how the tables have turned. Uh, he's a 6 cost 7k, uh, special character with 1k counter, and has an on play of add one card from the top of your deck to the top of your life cards. So you heal one, but not exactly. Uh, then you look at all your life cards, place one card back on the top of your deck, and the rest in any order, um, as you wish. Um, the thing is, the way I'm reading it, I think he returns them face down, right? I, I, I oh, yeah. that there's a way that you uh, have to remember which card was face up and which one wasn't, right? I don't see it anywhere specifically written, but I assume that's... No, it if it doesn't say face up, it's face down. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he's works. also a way to flip your face up cards face down, which is relevant for Salvo. Oh, uh, no, no, C -c cards stay the way they are, I'm pretty sure. If they were already face up, uh, I'm pretty sure they just stay face up and you it, it's like the same if you had a if top of your life was something that opponents katakuri put like character put on top of your life and then you're playing katakuri and you move it to the bottom it's still safe it, it still stay it still stays face up so it's not gonna flip down any face ups mm. then I find it kind of strange anyways um I guess in that case you can put the face up card. That's the one you put on top of your deck. I guess that's how you flip it face down. Anyways, uh, I find this card actually one of the weirder ones from the starter because I find it hard to evaluate the impact of the on-play ability. His body is what you should, what you would expect, as in he loses one k uh, for an on-play ability. And I don't think you're getting enough uh, to warrant 6 done. Um, yeah, uh, I find it hard to, to find a best case scenario. Did you find it? Except, uh, yeah, turning a face down thing uh, the other way and, and also uh, doing basically a lot of katakuri uh, looking like putting all your triggers on the top of your life. I just went to look for the Q&A and yeah, it says you must place fa face up life cards face up. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I do. There is nothing currently that I really like about the card, but I did remember something that I when I wanted to go back to Ace when we introduced Luffy Leader. What I remember mm -hmm. was uh, Ace's Wipe Your Pirates type, and uh, that type is getting blue support in OPO8. Mm -hmm. And uh, we already know, like from Marco, that some of its theming will be based on getting uh, cards from top of your life into play, like cheating them out. Uh, so Marco sets up those kinds of effects. Uh, and so does this card. So if if the theme gets like more ways to cheaply bring out Wipe Your Pirates cards from top of your deck into play, uh, and you can like put it together in a turn with Newgate, or even if even if it's not like just just imagine this scenario. Like if they make an ace that on play like plays out a, a Wipe Your Pirates type card from top of deck, like at some cost, and this would allow you to re rearrange the, the your life. To make sure that ace is on uh, on top of your life, bring out the small ace, evolve it into big ace, bring out something. Like, th there's sure, stuff but, like but that. If, if this is a very magical a example because I'm imagining a card, right? Uh, I sure. don't know. I don't know the support that's going to come out in the future, but that typing of Wiper Pirates might might become relevant at least for ace. It's but still a current... six dawn card, and if you have to combo it with another card, which means that it, it's a what seven, eight, nine, ten dawn combo. Like, dude, I I can get Moria and and, and some other uh, combo parts. Uh, you you'll have to do a lot better than that. And I mean, yeah, it's six four seven k and has a counter, so obviously its effect is not going to be the strongest thing around. Anyways, uh, for me, it's it's one of the few stinkers in I, in the. I did my best. Uh, I try so hard, and got so far. Uh, what's your take on Ivankov? Uh, okay, so Ivankov is a 3 cost 4k blocker with 1k counter. Uh, and on play, you can trash one card from top or bottom of your life, reveal up to one character card with a cost of 5 uh, from your hand, and add it to the top of your life cards face down. Uh, so, to, maybe I evaluated this card wrong, but I'm just uh, 
not a really big fan of effects like this. They remind me of... Uh, I, I don't remember the exact card effects, but the initial two yellow starters uh, for Big Mom and Yamato, they had like cards which are trash one card from... Or not even trash, it was like draw a card from top of your life, then do something with your life. Uh, and this is like, you lose a card from hand to put to set up one of the kids. It's a very, very costly way to do it. Especially exactly. as it's basically it's a worse Hiyori, Hiyori, right? Yeah. But it's a blocker, so it's a blocker. It costs one more though. The the body is not an attacking body. If it was a 5k, maybe, maybe we could talk so, talk about it, but it, it would have been uh overtuned for uh what, what the designers think about uh blockers, right? Yeah. So and I always find these bodies quite weird. As in, I always had a hard time with uh, the three-cost blue Doflamingo uh, blocker from OP1. Because on such a small body, it's basically a blocker as in a chomp blocker. As in a one-cost chopper. As in, it's just gonna eat one big attack, right? Yeah. Sure, it threatens an attack next turn. But on the other hand, they're very incentivized to kill it, because it's a blocker, right? And it's not easy to defend. All in all, I'm I'm never liking these uh, 3 cost 4k uh, blockers. And Emporio Mako is not, ex not an exception. On top of that, the ability is mid. Not even mid. Sub-mid, I would even say. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's What's better your, cards for the job. You, 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 your dream scenario is what? Do this on three, and then you just lost one card to put one of the. Then you still have to have the combo in hand, and then you do it what next turn, or you do it for five dawn? Like I'm, I'm just not seeing the lines. It's just like overly balanced. It's one of those things they randomly do. If he didn't say specifically cost five, maybe there would be some extra angles there, but. Like th this very much pigeonholes it into like uh, speci specifically upgrading the kids, and there's better ways to do that. There's cards that which are far more flexible, and flexibility goes a long way in One Piece because you need to be able to adapt to, to your opponent's game plan. So yeah, just not the good card. And I have to preface because some of the people might be confused. Uh, when Herba says kid, he means the the, the little uh, Sabo Luffy or something, and not the useless Captain Kid. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, on to the next card, Curly the Nun. Uh, she is a 5 cost 4k blocker, uh, which, as you said, a little bit sus. But the ability is actually quite interesting. Uh, uh, it, uh, she says, uh, and she also has a counter of 1k. On play, play one each of Sabo, Ace, and Monkey Diluffy with cost 2 from hand. This is. Even though it doesn't look that strong, uh, I'm kind of interested in this ability, right? It cheats 6 Dawn of value, right? Um, especially if there's no Sakazuki, which can easily clear uh, these bodies. You can just keep them there for safekeeping until uh, they're needed. The problem is, same with... Uh, Shachi and uh, what's the cat called from Kura Pirates? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, them and uh, Penguin and Shachi. I never like these cards that specify what they can play because it makes some hands which are relatively awkward. On the other hand, having a counter. Makes it more palpable, as in, okay, I don't have uh, the play of uh, Sabay's Luffy. I can counter with uh, the Dun. And I think that you're happy with the Dun if you got two little bodies, and with three, you're very happy. On the other hand, just playing them out and not using them is not as exciting. 
So you might need to do some either prep work or spend additional dawn on the turn to actually use them. But in general, maybe having one or two the dons is something we might consider uh, during our evolution of the list because the value is definitely there, I think. What's your take? Um, the card I would like to compare her to is Rebecca in the sense that when you play her and you play out, for example, two kids because you're not going to often hire one level three, uh, you could have played those two out just from hand regularly mm -hmm. and that would cost you four dawn. So what you get is a one cost 4k blocker how much 4k is irrelevant as a stat line as you said previously the 4k blockers like to be attacking threats you already need to attach a dawn that's a downside and then the question becomes do you want to play a one cost blocker in a deck such as this uh this is a very conditional one cost blocker when that happens like compared to rebecca they just like plays uh, grabs anything from trash and then plays a three cost from hand effectively making her one cost zero zero power uh, blocker, this is a lot more conditional, a lot less card efficient, and the dream scenario would be something like setting up the, that life preferably with black, yellow, Luffy and then what you ended up having is a one cost blocker with effect discard two cards, play two of the upgraded like uh, teen versions of, of the three brothers and get your leader to 9k uh like, that just sounds very convoluted, very uninteresting, and once again, as was the case with Tempore Ivankov, you just have access to a way better card that does the same job, at least in Black, Yellow, Luffy, in Gekko Moria. So, I think it's a lot of hoops to jump through. It could potentially be worth it, but as a 4-life leader, you will have issues with, uh, with hand size, with card advantage, and just straight up playing two cards from your hand that you could have played out anyways, but now you're playing the third card from your hand, uh, in the one plus blocker, it, it doesn't sound very appealing. I think if you are able to consistently grind value and have like huge hand, then you don't even need something like this, anyways, because you'll just be I able think to on counter the other with hand, your hand. Having a blocker is valuable when you're on four life because it makes you harder to push through. It basically exchanges one of your cards for a full attack, right? Yes, but your leader is 9k, so that one card could be a 1k in hand that's still sufficient to defend a, an attack. Because how, how often are you going to need a, a blocker? I mean, for, uh, like an it's a very case? similar concept. It's a very similar concept to a six cost uh, 6k uh, Luffy leader, as in uh, you want both. Uh, you want as much cards as you can get, but, but blockers you, also help. Yeah, but you don't play chopper. You don't play the the inefficient blockers. No. Your your blockers can yeah. still attack in in uh, mm -hmm. red purple Luffy. Agreed. So, um, yeah, not, not too high on the card. There, there's a maybe, like maybe in the future. I, I definitely agree. Uh, maybe I'm way too much uh, focused on the, on the, like, complete upside. Um, and maybe that's where the card shines the most, as in you prep up for it, and you just make a huge push, push late game, where you got... Maybe all three of them, and you're super big, and you have a blocker. I don't know. Uh, but I, out of the first three cards, this is actually the one that I'm saying it's possible to see some play. Anyways, well, let's not, sp not spend uh, any more time, uh, simply because of the fact that at the end of the day, even if you high roll, uh, you're not getting that much back. You cheated one dawn, sure you got a blocker. It's very hard to use all the bodies. You might have some uh, space issues on the board because it's gonna take four slots out of your five slots for characters, and so on and so on. Um, so curl the dawn for me at least. Even though I said that uh, there might be a possibility. Uh, what I mean to say is, I'll definitely see how the uh, how how it functions uh, I'll, to get a feel for the card. But everything you, I agree with everything you said, and every like value proposition you put on the card is not going in, in its favor. So, 
Yeah, if, oh, she, if, she, if she like discarded any two cards and brought kids from trash, like Ooh, the number no, machines, then she would be like really been. good. But yeah, that's once again we're dreaming of cards that don't exist. So yep, yep. Okay, uh, now we get to little Saba, and I think we're just gonna skip all the little uh, kids as you call them. They all have the same ability, if I really yep. think so, right? The same they cost, all, same power. Yeah, they're all two cost. They all have a counter, and you can uh, trash them, and. Uh, reveal the top card. If it's the older version, you play it, and your leader gets two uh, K until end of your opponent's next turn. Yeah, and they they all have the since this was before their respective pirate adventures. They all they all just go a kingdom, and no additional types. Or actually, maybe Luffy yep. and Ace are the, the little village, but no village, whatever. But yeah, the typing is not going to be relevant with any of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, nothing to say here about them. They're basically part of a bigger package, so we will always discuss these cards in the context of other cards. The cards yeah. themselves, I think, are um, irrelevant. So yeah, the first children are actually brimming with mm -hmm. potential. That's a poetic way to the, the one we're actually going to discuss is uh, Saba. Uh, he's a 5 cost 6k, has a counter, and on play, essentially, as we call it, he thunderbolts. Uh, he says that you, uh, you can on play as a cost thresh one card, from the top or bottom, this is actually quite relevant, uh, and KO up to one of your opponent's uh, characters with a cost of 5 or less. Now, first I have to say are two things. Uh, there are two leaders which actually find this quite nice. First of them is Ace. Basically, if you missed uh, with your leader and you just activate Sabo, uh, you basically Trash the life you would have trashed otherwise, right? Yeah. Uh, in the case of Luffy, you actually want to go through your life and hit zero at an opportune time. And this is one of those ways to, to get there. And uh, removing a five cost is great. Um, and one of the things why it's great is it includes forecasts. And the forecasts have been historically, at least for the few last few formats, the premium um, unit cost slot. A lot of very, very impactful cards were forecast. Uh, and also five costs actually hits a little bit more cards, but more importantly, it hits a lot of uh, five cost blockers. Uh, and Except the other sub. <laughs> it doesn't sure, hit the sub. Course. I mean, uh, maybe next oh. turn you can kill that Sabo, right? So all in all, how how is this valuable? Well, as soon as I put it that way, on play, play a Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt is a card which costs two, and you sometimes play it, right? Here, you get it for free. And we always say when you bundle it, you should always consider it as in you drew the card and you played it for free, right? And uh, if that's the evaluation we put it, of course, Thunderbolt has a very strong trigger, and that is costed into the card. If that card didn't have trigger, it will probably be a, maybe a one cost event, right? But still, uh, having an on play effect, which is essentially another card being played, is always super strong, right? And those are the type of cards we are always itching to put into our deck and see how to make it work, right? And Sabo is definitely uh, definitely um, strong in that sense. And also it's a May, uh, which is relevant here. Uh, do you have any specific uh, points coming to mind? Um, yeah, so... First of all, he increases Sabo density, because uh, there's not many uh, Sabo targets. Of course. Uh, his effect on its own, it's like not the most impressive, just because trashing one life is a huge cost. But as you said, there's two leaders in this, uh, uh, in this starter that could do it for effectively free. Uh, Ace just... It, it fits very naturally in the curve. Your opponent plays a 5 cost, and you attach one down to Ace. Uh, Put something. Sorry, no. Ace is two down. Yeah, it doesn't fit as nice on the curve. My bad there. But yeah, you can get that uh, out of life for free, or you can get it uh, into play with the small Sabo. The nice thing that it does for Black Yellow Luffy is that in Black Yellow you can actually combine it with cost removal 
and as we know, like mm-hmm. cost, uh, cost reduction, pardon me, uh, when there's Ice Age. So this is a very neat way for Black Yellow Wolfy to deal with really big bodies uh, in combination with Ice Age, which would otherwise it risk dying to because it has like no intrinsic way of outing big things. Uh, what I will say, because it's a known fact, is that in Opio 7, a better way of to remove cards comes out in uh, in Egghead Luffy, which trashes itself to kill a four cost. And it even has a trigger if it, if it's in life. Uh, so, how valuable is this card currently? Well, it's probably the best option you have for removal in in these types of deck in, deck in these types of decks in yellow. But eventually, it will probably get rotated out. It has the Revolutionary Army and Dress Rosa tags which could be relevant for future waves of support. But currently, uh, it's like solid. It's it's not something I would write home about. Oh, no, a... no, no, definitely. Uh, don't let me give you the wrong impression. Uh, I'm definitely trying to uh, slightly uh, upsell this card. It's, it's not mind-blowing. But what you have to keep in mind is it's the combo potential, right? that uh, you're actually playing some cards which are slightly suboptimal just because they're part of the greater whole. Yeah, I mean, uh, get, getting yourself to zero life is pretty important. And until we have better tools and that, to do and that... And the fact that he's a uh, 5 cost sabo is extremely relevant, right? Um, so yeah, uh, the card, solid. I, I, I think solid is definitely uh, where he should land. But when taken in as a whole, I think it's it's an easy four off. I think in in all of the in all of the decks, maybe not all of them, because uh, we said uh, yeah, four sounds a bit might. much. Uh, maybe cut it uh, if you, if you have access to the other sabo, you can probably cut. Uh, yeah, yeah, in the other decks, you have to run it just for the upgrade potential. But uh, all in all, uh, it's a card you'll see for sure. Um, then we go to Shanks. Uh, he's a 7 cost, 7k without any counter. He has a slash die. And on play, you may turn one of your face up life cards face down as a cost. And then, if your opponent has 7 or more cards in their hand, trash up to one card from the top of their opponent's life cards. Okay, so. <laughs> uh, actually, the comparison that comes to mind. For this card, uh, do you know what card I'm thinking of? Uh, I know what mechanic I'm thinking of, but I'm not sure if, if it's the card, if that card does the same thing. So uh, the card I'm thinking of is seven cost mom. Uh, that makes sense. Because uh, uh, the outcome can be the same, right? Uh, you, you spend seven dawn, you get a big body, and your opponent treasures alive. Uh, this is... You can play more, plan more into it, because oftentimes you really want the banish um, from Big Mom, and you don't get it. Here, it's part of your game plan. You can guarantee that your opponent loses one life, right? Well, guarantee they uh, need seven or more cards in hand. That's the sure, sure. But on the other hand, as we mentioned, especially in these decks, you will be hitting for big numbers. So getting seven or more cards in their hand can be relevant. But that condition, I think, is actually something that will kill the card. Because the card doesn't have a counter. And whenever you have so situational cards without the counter, that's a recipe for disaster. I always say that your non-counter cards should ideally be either part of a very strong combo or cards which you, like immediately just pop on the table. They go into your hand, and as soon as you can play them out, you, you want to play them out. And Shanks is a non counter card, which sometimes you draw and you're like, mm, I don't want to play this. And then you're starting to play a bad deck, basically, when you have non counter cards which you don't want to play. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree. Uh, sorry. No, no, please. Uh, you had one other card too. Mention. Okay, uh, there were some technical difficulties. My webcam just decided to die, so sorry for the interruption. Anyways, uh, back to Shanks. The the mechanic I had in mind was 
Yeah, basically the same thing that uh, Christian had uh, said Seven Mom does. Like, trashing a life is equivalent to having Rush and just attacking your opponent's life with Banish. Uh, Which is pretty strong. Yeah, uh, it is strong, but the issue here is, of course, it's not a permanent Banish. You're not going to be doing it again next turn. And double conditional cards are always, like, it's red flags all around. Because you need your you need to have a face up card in life. That's like already a condition. It's a, it's less of a condition in some in some of the leaders, but it's still a condition. And then your opponent needs to have seven or more cards in hand. And when that's on the, on a non counter card that, as Christian said, you have to play out, it's just not going to it's not going to make the cut. So yeah, just the uh, but I mean. I still think that the potential is there. Like, if you can get these two conditions for free, then... And I think that we need some more cards which enable that. I think that the ability is definitely valuable enough to include in the deck. I just don't think that you can get the consistency there. And then, I think the card is... Even though the ability is valuable, like, he definitely should have been an 8k, I think. 7k I mean, just, just feels slightly weaker. Just compare it with the very old card that pretty much nobody ran, except in some very rare instances to, to slightly counter Whitebeard. The, oh yeah, the, I the, remember the card. The, law it's from, the, blue, the blue law, right? Yeah, that's like, I think 6, 7, no counter. If your opponent has like 6 or more cards in hand, or maybe 7 or more I cards in hand, six, I think six. They, they, they draw a life. So, like, the end goal is... Slightly different instead of trashing a life, they draw it, but the card didn't get ran, even in like a more aggressive uh, blue strategies. Though so maybe, maybe some combination of uh, that and Shanks in, in blue yellow ace could do wonders, but I would not bet on it. Even though, uh, actually, yeah, uh, I'll leave it at that. Anyways, uh, Shanks, um, almost good. Then we go to uh, Little Ace. Yeah, go we'll, kingdom, we'll just so. skip it over, and then we get to the big ace, who's uh, 5 cost, 7k, no counter. He has an on-play of uh, being able to get rush, but only if you have two or less life cards. Uh, my opinion is, first of all, if you remember one of the episodes I said that the designers of the game are very reluctant to give us uh, 7k rush bodies, which are relatively aggressively uh, costed. And this is maybe the first one. I can't remember any other. Uh, Te technically, cost, technically Luffy and Zoro, but yeah. I guess so, yeah. But, but it's still not 7K a 7k on defense, cost, which is... You, you still need... Yeah, it's it's less defense and also you need to be on 6 down. Anyways. In a way, Ace also is not an on-curve uh, rusher, because... Usually on 5 dawn, you're probably not going to be on 2 or less life. You can make that work, actually. Uh, on 1, you would play... On 1 or 3, you would play one of the self-awakeners. And then your opponent has to attack into you. And then you are on 2 life, and then you can use the ability. In any case... Um, I still think that the ability is quite strong. Uh, 7k rush is such a enticing raw combination that uh, I think that you can make the condition work most of the time. Also, of course, being a 5k a 5 cost uh, brother, you're usually not playing him for five, but rather for um, for two, right? Uh, all in all, it, it makes this card, I might even say, the strongest of the yellow uh, big brothers. If it works, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think there's much more to say about this card. Uh, 7k, 7k rush is an excellent thing to have. And you can make it work most of the time. Yeah, uh, I was just... Uh... Simply agree. Like I, the not so bold take that this is the strongest uh, non-leader card in the set. I think it will see no, play. No, the strongest big brother in the set. Well, do you think there's a stronger card in the set? 
Am I forgetting something? Because I, mm. I, when I think yellow cards that are going to see play in other decks, this is the first one that comes to mind. Like 5 plus okay. 7k is such mm -hmm. an overloaded stat line. Once again, vanilla stat lines are good. And this is vanilla stat line with rush. Conditional rush, but it's not that difficult of a condition to fulfill in yellow decks because they they are quite good at life manipulation. And yeah, it's just a very good aggressive piece to have. Its stat line means it's not going to be easily taken out in combat. It needs to be taken out through uh, through a card effect, most likely, especially if, if he gets to do the thing on curve. So when you compare this to like what Rage needs to do to get Rush Ichiji, I don't know, card, card just looks insane. And obviously, it will be very dependent on the meta, how how much you like being on 2 life. But yeah, it's a very good aggressive piece. And, and No, no, I, yeah. I agree with you. Um, I, I think definitely it's, uh, it's the strongest card. Uh, I mean, aside from leaders. Uh, what I would counter... Uh, in your argument is the card slightly reminds me of Rush Katakuri, the the focus one. You remember the card? <clears throat> yes. Uh, I mean, it's it's the same idea. That I, I I was thinking about maybe mentioning that Yellow gets these vanilla rushers, like vanilla stat lane rushers, but then I abandoned it because I thought I would run for too long. But yeah, it, it's no, the no, same. No, but, but I think that the the consideration about including it in your deck might end up being the same. As with that card. As in non counter card, slightly conditional. And like conditionality is not something you're looking for in aggressive cards. You just wanna smash them, right? But uh, yeah, uh, not to ramble on too much. Uh, agreed. Strongest card in this in the starter. Uh, has the best uh, probably has the best uh, Outlook uh, going forward. Yeah. Okay. The next card is uh, the 2K Machino. So Machino gets another one cost, zero power, 2000 counter card. Uh, I love to see it, honestly. The red one was perhaps the best 2K in, in the game at the time. Uh, has a simple effect. On play, you may add one card from top or bottom to your life to your hand. This is a cost, even though it says may. Uh, look at all your life cards and place them in the back. In, Place them back in your life area in any order. So, yeah, she helps you empty life and achieve uh, achieve those uh, beneficial effects of having less life. In case of Black Yellow Luffy Leader, you go down to zero life ASAP. She's a good way to do that. And also, as a byproduct, she, she can set up uh, playing out brothers from your life without uh, having to put them there yourself. So if you see a 5 cost a Luffy Sabo Ace... In life, you now know that at some point in the game, you can just uh, slam the kid, play play out the the character from life, and further help uh, reduce your life count, which is again most important in Black Yellow Luffy. I think two K counters are whenever they're playable, they're at their best when they cost one. So this kind of makes Maki you know a default consideration at least until Flampe comes out in EBO one because she's another one cost. I think she's counter. very overshadowed by Flumpen. Um, yeah, just getting one card compared to looking at all your life and rearranging it, I think the comparison is mute. I will always take the card. And I think that this card only has a home in Red Yellow Luffy because uh, with Ace, if you miss and you use this card to take it back to your hand, you spent a don in a card just to get another card. Uh, in a way, it could have been a uh, yeah, one don zero k draw card, which is basically not what you want to do, especially as we don't have any kind of synergy of, I don't know, uh, using uh, this body once it's on the board, like putting it on top yeah, or buffing one costs and so on. So... Uh, Somewhat playable, but I think it's one of the first things you want to uh, upgrade uh, once uh, EB01 hits. Yeah, uh, I don't think there's more, any more to say. Uh, Harva basically uh, hit the nail on the head. The strongest uh, 
and what you're hoping to do with this is see uh, which one of the brothers is in your life and then in a way you got it for f as in you don't have to work to put it into life you you just get it for, for... anything else or are we moving no to you, you can move on to one of the better cards in the set mm -hmm. uh monkey the garp he is a yellow nami uh what do we mean by nami is it's a one cost uh 2k uh card to counter which has a non-play effect of uh, searching for five cards for Asabo, Ace, or Luffy, with cost five or less. And uh, I don't think we always have to mention this, but these searchers are always the highlight. Like, whenever one of the archetypes has these searchers, you're always like, okay, that's like a bump in their power level. They're never bad. You have some early gameplays, there's, there are bodies to remove the little, uh, I don't know, uh, green searchers or little uh, machinos and so on. Like, having small bodies is something. To top it off, all off, they give you some consistency if you're looking for specific pieces. And I think this is where this shines. In other... Um, I can't remember, aside from Reiju, any other deck having such a specific need for specific pieces. And here you are trying to combine the little, uh, the kid version and the adolescent uh, version, right? And uh, therefore I'm valuing search abilities even higher than I would otherwise. So we have a type of card which we value super high and it's in an archetype which really wants to search. So this is a absolute banger of a card, in my yeah. opinion. I mean, I fully agree. It's like, when these cards exist, they they become like the the basis of your mulligan, essentially, because your game plan is going to revolve around something very specific, and these cards, which increase consistency of that something very specific, and then also provide additional benefits, like they're auto-included four copies, like you, you want to play as many as possible, just because your game plan is going to have to function and having a choice in which cards you pick for a specific match or for a specific game is so much more powerful than even just drawing them at random or like having a draw one effect. So yeah, this is like this this entire archetype of one cost 2k searchers across all the different colors and uh, and allegiances or character traits. I'm forgetting what the little thing below the name is called. It's just... I would even say it forms the basis of, of One Piece gameplay at this point, because almost every good deck has had one of these, uh, or like a variant on the searcher for early mm -hmm. game. Like Brain or something, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, not, not to spend any more uh, needless breaths. Uh, great card. Uh, what do you think about Monkey D. Luffy? The big one. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so, he's a 5 cost, 6,000 power character like the rest of his brothers, has a 1,000 counter. Certain aces and 5 cost, okay, yeah. Uh, activate main once per turn, uh, gains 2,000 power until the start of the opponent's next turn, then you have one or more life cards, draw a card from trash. Uh, draw a card and trash, trash. trash the life. The top card of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, this is probably the best tool that the... Uh, if you're trying to start Black Yellow Luffy, I'll start off with him because, once again, he's the most relevant leader out of the three, at least out of the gate. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a very good way to avoid uh, being fatigued because you effectively draw your life. But by trashing life and drawing a card, you're getting somewhat similar effect to that of Sakazuki's leader cycle. Yeah, yeah. Because you're you, see, you, see, you see a full extra card, and what you're playing is a 5 cost 8k vanilla, or like not vanilla because you can do it again next turn, but it's a very big body that once it starts attacking, it's not going to be outed easily at eight at, at eight thousand power. So it's like thatch, and back in uh, in Opio two meta, and yeah, he's obviously an evolution. Uh, has relevant typing, which if we ever get some color hybrids, uh, could be important in the future. But his biggest like. Draw point is he lets you use that one life that you either want to 
like if you have a blank with ace, he gives you a use for it. Like just just compare it to uh to how Machina would uh, use that dawn to draw to draw a card from life. This is the same, but like lets you see more cards. I'm I'm rambling a bit. Point is, this is a pretty good card. You will definitely be playing it. Anything containing uh, these brothers. Yep. Uh, being a five quest Luffy, uh, sometimes using the ability immediately when you play play him, and then maybe even later, uh, just because if he gets removed, you you still got. I wouldn't say value because you're not getting value. You're losing a life and basically taking it into your hand. But at some point, and for some decks, especially uh, yellow or black Luffy, that is a positive effect. For the other decks, uh, the only like benefit I can see is. Um, basically, uh, Ace turning a uh, miss into a card draw, which is not bad if that's your low roll, right? Um, he also has a nice potential to uh, end games for little if you you basically get a free two k uh, to yeah, push the game. Yeah, you you need to have a life to draw to use this effect. You're just, mm -hmm. Since yeah, it's yeah. not a cost, you just use it. It's a free plus two k, so five cost, eight k, one one. Yep. Um it's it's a decent card. Uh I think I'm actually <laughs> sure the card is nice, but I'm really drawn to the counter 1k. Like I, I really like the card as a whole package. And the 1k counter really like uh makes the makes the package whole, I think. Okay, so uh, a pretty great card, um, uh, helps, uh, black, uh, yellow Luffy and, uh, blue, yellow Ace, uh, has some, uh, closing game potential, all in all, a strong card. Yamato, on the other hand, is a weird one. It's a 5 cost, 4k, 2k counter, rush card. Uh, we had another, uh... 5 cost, 4k rush card, uh, do you remember which one it is? Pranos OK in purple. Pranos OK, yeah. Was and, this, did, uh, did you, were you not able to remember or were you just testing me? No, no, I was testing you. I, I, I played <laughs> Pranos OK, so I remember very fondly. You, you never know. Um, and I think that that's a actually low-key quite, quite good, as in Late game, it gives you an additional attacker. And uh, usually it's a 2k. And 2k's, I really like when my 2k's are late game relevant. Because most of the time you're keeping your 2k's for the late game, right? And rush is most relevant in the end game. So, even though the power level is not like, oh... Uh, Something to uh, cry home about, as is, I don't know, for example, Perona. I still think that, um, yeah, having the option of having an additional attacker on your 2k is not bad. However, she has, or he, uh, has an on-play ability, at, that being, look at all your life cards. Place one at the top of your deck, and the rest back in your life area in any order. And... I'm looking at it and I'm like, dude, uh, this combination of these two things are not synergistic. As in, the unplayability is something which is kind of set up ish. Maybe I want something on top of my deck, maybe I want to awaken, lose life basically. And that doesn't play well with spending quite a few dawn just to get an additional attacker. So, in general, 2k, uh, 5 cost, 4k, rusher, interesting, maybe not always strong, depends on the meta quite, right? Uh, and you generally have to be a relatively aggressive deck to, to use it best. But it, it is something to, which is nice to have. And uh, Hrvaj, do you have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, a part of the card you always like to ignore is the typing. Uh, Yamato is Land of Wano, so you're already thinking, okay, which which text could surge this, and uh, 
Currently, the only one of searchers are in green. It's the Momo, and I think there might be another thing coming soon. I'm, I don't remember exactly, but point is, if you're playing green-yellow, which is the Yamato leader or the Arlong leader, would this be a 2k you're interested in? Well, Yamato leader is geared aggressively, but has better like late-game tools to, to close out games, like Holy Jones and stuff. And it also has better 2Ks in Land of, Land of Wano. At least Izo is a better 2K, and then this has to compete with all the non-Land of Wano generic good 2Ks that come in green and yellow. Uh, obviously, the rush effect could be a neat gimmick, but I don't know. I think the gold standard for rush 2Ks is Jozu, and he was 4 cost 4K, and he didn't have the stupid cost attack, or like the stupid effect attack that makes it unusable before, uh, before effectively zero life. Because if this fails the game shot, you just uh, insta lose. Um, so yeah, I don't think this will be a first choice for anyone, but it is a potentially nice piece of uh, future support for some Vano decks, especially if they get searchers in other colors. Wrong. Yeah, yeah I, I checked. Uh, Franoski is also 5 cost 4k Russia. Yeah, did, did I say otherwise? I think you said uh, for four cost. No, okay. Jozu. Uh, jo Jozu was the gold standard. That's what oh, I said. Oh, uh, jo Jozu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I completely uh, blanked here. Uh, my apologies. Um, Anyways, so. yeah. Uh, it's a card of all time, basically. No. Um, Next up is... Let's do Fla Flame Dragon King, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's an event. Uh, two cost counter. Uh, up to one of your leader or characters gains 4,000 power during this battle, then look at all your life cards and place them back in your life area in any order. And then as a trigger, you may add one card from top or bottom of your life cards to your hand, add up to one card from your hand to the top of your life cards. So I actually start with the trigger because I think we've had uh, we've had this effect already. It was on some OPO4 card, I want to say. It might have been OPO3, actually. I and think it's Jimbe on the card, right? Yeah, but I cannot remember the name. It wasn't a very relevant. It doesn't uh, matter. Yeah, like it's convenient that you can do it, and I think I guess the card's general uh, everything it does revolves around setting up your life. Uh, but ultimately, this isn't a meta for it. There might be a meta for it. Just two cost four K counter is probably the easiest thing to play around in this game, especially when there is like no actual disruptive effect like Pun Gibson or. Or Love Love Mellow, which just uh, draws another card. Um, my opinion of the card is like, it's so so. Like, it, it could have its use in the future, but there are better, more reliable ways to, to put stuff you want exactly in your life. This, this is maybe actually super valuable in, in decks which are not, in Yellow Leaders which are not in this deck, like Enel or Katakuri, if they really wanted to play an event that allows them to manipulate life. Uh, this would probably be the event to do that with. So I'm still kind of not sold on spending a card worth of value, roughly, just to look at your life and uh, get some value. I think they're trying to sell us on that concept, sell us on that concept, uh, in this starter, where they're like, ooh, if you know that the adolescent version is on top, wow, you got a combo you, you're popping off, but... I don't want to use a full card for that. Yeah, I see it more as a way of like setting up your future triggers, and that, that's why I think it will have more potential in like other yellow leaders. Though it is also anti-synergistic with that playstyle, because at least for a turn, you're delaying the potential of any trigger by defending your leader. And if you're providing characters to attack into uh, for your opponent, then you're also like not going to get the benefit of your life having a good trigger if they're just attacking into your characters. And you're defending them so they keep attacking into those characters. Uh, Correct, yeah. So yeah, there's some anti-synergy that's like not immediately obvious, but when you think about how the games play out, it actually makes a lot of sense that the, it's like an obstacle to itself in a way. Like there's definitely mm -hmm. a possibility it gets played in the future just because information can definitely be king. But yeah, I would not I would not expect to see it immediately played in any of the meta decks. Yep, I, I I just simply need more and stronger payoff of uh, the fact that you know your life. I mean, there's also yeah, sure some residual value of knowing that you have uh, encounters in life, maybe some triggers in life. Sure, but uh, I 
I don't know. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I'm just thinking about all the possible ways you can use the knowledge about your life. But yeah, just simply the mathematician in me is thinking that I want the numbers. I want the I want the car draw. I want the tempo gain. I want the ramp. G give me something, right? And this essentially gives you nothing. And to get something out of it, I think you need to put uh, way too much work into it. I don't know. I'm, I might be wrong, but in general, the two cost events are... You either keep them for late game, and then you want to um, basically... Uh, they basically save you the game, right? Yeah, you survive. Um, yep. And this one kind of reminds me of Thunder Bagua, where it's an event that you actually want to play early in the game and get value out of it that way. Now, do I want to spend two dawn just to be able to do that? Uh, for example, <laughs> the only nice way to, to play this is uh, you go second and on their th three dawn turn they attack into you you spend the two dawn to counter. So you counter with one card, sure you over counter, it doesn't matter, you just spend one card to counter. And you get the take a look at your life for free. And also taking a look at your life is more valuable the earlier the game is and the more life you have, right? Yeah, I think we're dwelling on this card way too long. Like it, it yeah, has... yeah, yeah. So the high point would be, yeah, you go second, you counter with this. And even then it's so-so. Uh, the trigger is just horrible. Like spending a whole card ju just to set up another card. Oh, I I I don't want to be uh, doing that in a game of One Piece. Uh, Gum Gum Jet Spear, on the other hand, is a weird one. It basically says uh, it's a one cost uh, counter. Up to one of your leader characters gains plus two K power during this battle, and if you have zero life cards, draw one card. And the, uh, the trigger is the same, a very lukewarm one uh, that the previous card had. Uh, this card reminds me of another card relatively early in the game. Uh, it's ulti hitting heads with uh, Luffy. I don't know, what's the name of the card? Oh, I think it was the purple event, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which basically said, yeah, uh, gain uh, 2k power, draw a card, but you lost to done. So, in a way... Uh, this one says, if you have zero life cards, draw a card. And the other one said, uh, if you have 10 done, uh, draw one card. Because you would usually not play it uh, if you're not in 10 done. And uh, paying one dawn uh, to have a 2k, which draws a card, is decent. However... Most of the time, all the other uh, one-cost events basically have that built in for free, right? Yeah, because they're buffed for 3 or 4k. Exactly. So, Radical or Guard Point, in a way, they also draw a card, but that card is a 2k or a 1k, yeah, which you for, immediately can't yeah, well, it's right? like Elf or, or I'm forgetting what the one from Starter is called that's plus 3k. Uh, it's minus 3k on the opponent, the, the arrow or something. Whatever. Effectively the same thing, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and even those events oftentimes don't get played, right? Because we have other things to do. And then all in all this, the requirement is also huge, like having zero life. Yeah, that, that's what I want to say, just because the card, the card sucks because you need to be at zero life. And when you're in zero life, if your one card uh, requires a dawn to only counter 2k, it's a bad card, because that's not the position you want to find yourself in. And any extra efficiency you might get out of it is all overshadowed by the fact that you could draw a non-counter, and then you paid $1 mm -hmm. for a 2k. And yep, you're yep. just... Like, you're not going to be clutched out by this card in any situations where Elthor or something would not do a way better job. Yep. And when you would prefer card draw, then extra counter power is earlier in the game. And then you're most likely not in zero life. So I, I don't think the card is working out. And the last card for today is the Three Brothers Bond, which is 
basically a search event. We know uh, we know them from all the other uh, different versions of the card. Uh, and this one also searches for Sabo, Ace, and Luffy. And it also has the uh, same benefit that Garp has. This is a search. Uh, always the search events are slightly weaker than the search bodies, because search bodies have a counter, this one don't. Here you uh, get the trigger, which is, I think, uh, with these uh, leaders actually decent, because we are manipulating life, and uh, it, it's uh, slightly better than maybe in some other uh, decks. Uh, but in general, these events always end up being uh, an additional, basically, searcher. If the four... If you need more than the four uh, you already have. What I'm trying to say is, Monkey D. Garp is definitely in your deck. Is this in your deck? Possibly. If you basically just value the um, the combo, and I think that most of the decks will value the combo because you have to combine uh, the Very little specific one and cards. the lessons. Yeah, and uh, if you think about it, and it should also remind. Uh, it should definitely always pop in your head. Um, the other deck, which is also playing and really loving uh, these search events, is Reju. And Reju, in a way, also functions similarly to uh, to this uh, growing up mechanic, right? They, uh, she also has the small uh, members of the family uh, who become uh, big, right? And same as with that deck, you really wanted the additional uh, search power to get the missing pieces. And yeah. in the similar vein, I think that you will... I think you definitely will like uh, some copies of the Three Brothers Bond. I agree. It's like the standard search event that we have seen since, like, Sapo, the Archipelago, and Opio 1, mm -hmm. and Baroque Works, or whatever the, the blue one was called. Uh, yeah, it's just a standard inclusion. The main benefit this has, like, the comparisons to Rage all stand. Uh, the only thing that's different is you have two searchers that go five deep, but they're not repeatable, like, like the stages. But your mm -hmm. event that searches is better because the trigger is actually the main effect instead of draw one card. So even when it's in life, you're going to get better use out of it. And uh, once again, due to yellow, having a lot of life manipulation, you can set this up... Uh, fairly early on into your life if you uh, if you don't want to pay the cost. Like you can put it from your hand in, into life and just trigger it from there or just rearrange it with Machina or whatever. It, it's I mean, just it, standard inclusion. It's, it's not a big thing, but, but it, it, it might be worth it, right? Uh, yeah. My comparison to, to Rage was more that we had these search events before, but not a lot of decks uh, liked them that much. Uh, we actually played some uh, uh, Archipelago in um, 6k uh, Luffy. Oh. Because you really needed the uh, the cost uh, Luffy, right? Yeah. And that's the only deck where I was considering running the events. The only other one was being Rajo. And why are we doing that in Rajo? Is because of the comboing, right? And that, that's why uh, I'm, I'm bringing that deck up, because I also think that these decks will need more searching, simply because of the fact that you need to pair up the cards for maximum potential. Yeah. Okay, and you're so perfectly fine with paying the premium of one Don uh, to be able to do that. I'll play the Fun Police again. We're going for two hours already, and we still need to do the, the Diamond and the Rough segment, so let's wrap it up oh, before we yeah. get started. This is the last uh, part. Okay. Uh, uh, as a treat for you, uh, for sticking with us uh, to, till the very end. Uh, the diamond in the rough for today is Ulti. Uh, Hrvaj, tell us what Ulti does. Yeah, let me just bring up the card on the screen. Actually, no, I'll just do that in editing, but I need to bring it up on screen so I can read it. Uh, so she's a 4 cost 5k, has a 1k counter. Yeah, I know the effect of the top of my head, why do I need to bring it up? Uh, look at the top, if your leader is multicolored, look at the Three cards on top of your life, uh, add one to hand, place rest on top or bottom in any order. So effectively she's a, when you compare it to a card like Kuzan, uh, due to her low reach and what she can search, she's effectively a draw one. 
but you get to be a bit more specific and maybe set up some plays as is the nature of uh, of blue leaders. The downside is, of course, that your leader has to be uh, in more than one color, which is, I would say, a decent downside because once you play her out, she becomes nothing more than a vanilla. And then mm -hmm. the value you need to extract from the search and from the... And from the setup, it needs to be huge. Like, why is Kuzan good? Even though he doesn't have a counter, he has that threat of when attacking minus one Dawn, which is, like, huge. And this is just one effect that you need to be able to utilize somehow. But this is the type of card that you want to play on curve, so for Dawn. So if you leave stuff on top to set up, you're going to draw the next thing you set up and then hopefully benefit from the remaining top deck on your next turn. But how much can you abuse stuff on top of your deck on six Dawn? Like, it, it gets into questionable territories... Uh, to extract the max value from. Uh, I actually think you have more to say. I'll just... Uh... Oh, definitely. Uh, one of the motivations for this card is basically the new... Um, the new Mark. angle they're pitching oh. with uh, blue, and that is uh, top of the life matters. Uh, that of was... Deck. Uh, top of the deck, yeah. Um, that was something they started with uh, the Dolphin from OP01, and they basically didn't... Uh, go back to that mechanic up until uh, with the recent reveals. And I think that, sure, comparison to Kuzani is uh, apt. Uh, she has a counter, which is very valuable. We never want to undersell that. Um, she draws your card and then also either sets you up for the, the next draw, if you're playing her on curve, or you can set up for... Um, whatchamacallit, uh, for a combo if it's in a later turn. For example, uh, if you play her on 7 Dawn, you can... Imagine we're playing Dofi. We play her on 7 Dawn, uh, we put um, uh, 7 Warlord on top, for 3 Dawn we use our hero ability. Actually, that doesn't work then. Then, then we uh, d draw the other card. What I'm trying to say is, uh, she can set up the seven, the nine cost uh, Sanji, and um, also she puts bad cards on the bottom of your deck. For example, I really don't want to see uh, four cost Kuzan uh, late in the game, because it's a relatively slow card, doesn't have a counter, and the ability to basically curate your next or your uh, two next uh, draws. Is somewhat valuable. So, all in all, some top of the deck manipulation, uh, some um, hand uh, pruning, as in um, it might give you a counter instead of a non counter card, which is basically like drawing a card late game, right? Um, um, searching for specific uh, combo pieces. I think that the package is slowly getting there where ulti actually becomes uh, quite a playable card. Well, I agree. Uh, once again, typing will, might matter, because there is a blue Animal Kingdom Pirate Searcher in Who's Who. Uh, there is several blue purple le leaders, so your mind immediately should wander to like, uh, uh, can I do stuff if I search on Igashima, if I search this, because it becomes cross-color which is like mm -hmm. the default for her, and if the support for Animal Kingdom Pirates comes in black in OP8, there might be some blue-black angle as well, uh, with like the discount Sakazuki leader that we get after the ban. Uh, yeah, I mean, her ability of setting... Like, drawing a card is fine. It's like a very, you know, okay thing to do. You effectively play the searcher that could not miss, because she's always going to add a card, mm -hmm. and... Even though those are the best when they're very cheap, there's still some value to putting a body on board that replaces itself in hand because your opponent has to put some resource into outing it at some point and you already got the resource back from just playing the card. But to actually abuse the the setup on top of life, assuming you put stuff on top. If you put it on the bottom, it doesn't matter. Like You just filtered out some bad cards. There's invisible value to that as well. But to actually like get some insane value, you would need to have a deck that's built around abusing that top of deck, or at least have some cards which are made to do that, like Emporio Ivanko from, uh, from Starter Deck 12, Zora and Sanji, 
is one of the cards that come to mind. Obviously, uh, the Nanko Sanji from OPO6 is going to be the the prime example of uh, such abuse. But there's also... I'm trying to remember what, what card it is in OPO8 that plays out the Whitebeard Pirates card from, from top. I probably should have checked those before going into the segment because it was also relevant to to Blue Yellow Ace. Uh, but yeah, uh, she's a card that's like very unintrusive on your build because it's a 1k counter. She has a mm-hmm. relevant type. Her effect is like a very low level of default good and there's always going to be, like not every card in your deck can be insane. There's always going to be some subpar cards. Why did I compare her to Kuzan? Well, because we did test her in a slot similar to Kuzan when testing Sakazuki in OPO5. Like she came into consideration for having the similar stat line, a similar effect, but the counter, which Kuzan didn't have. Uh, but obviously over time, it became very clear that Kuzan's ability to accumulate value with the with the cost reduction on attack was much more relevant than just uh, some filtering, which at least in Sakazuki, a leader that can cycle away cards and keep digging, uh, having a reach of three cards at the top of your deck is not its not very relevant. Yeah, but in other decks, I think it, it is more relevant because same with Sakazuki, it, it could be, yes. often, decks, often decks have situational cards. With Sakazuki, you can easily just discard your situational cards, which you don't need. Other decks don't have that benefit. Especially, this is important for your non counter cards, right? And here, ulti can just put them on the bottom. And if you know you specifically need something, you can still keep it on top. So, all in all, I think a very unassuming card, but a card that actually already now has decent value and potential. And also, down the line, especially if blue keeps going in the direction of top of the deck matters, I think this card might pop up in uh, the best blue decks. Okay, and with that in mind, uh, we bid you all farewell. Uh, reminder, uh, on our Patreon you can find our two in-depth guides of Gekko Moria and Sakazuki. What you can expect from us relatively soon is an overview of the meta and the tier list of the leaders, and of course uh, the next episode of the podcast uh, next week Wednesday. Uh, yep. Thank you once again for joining us. And be safe and uh, have fun playing. Yeah, I'll hopefully fix my camera because I'm waving now, but you cannot see it. So, yeah. <laughs> have a nice uh, day, well, guys. I will wave with both hands then. Uh, bye-bye.